Let's do this. It's time for Hanging with Langan. I like that she's got a big, dirty mouth that gets her in trouble. Wow. Hey, you guys. Hello. Welcome to Hanging with Langan. How are you? We're back. We're back together. We belong together. I have a great guest coming up. You know what we do here, Hanging with Langan, fun, heart, smart. I love chatting with everyone from academics to authors to alcoholics and everyone in between. So I get some really great people on here today, and I want to set this up properly. In a moment, you're going to meet a very fascinating man named Robert Edsel. He's the founder and the chairman of the Monuments Men Foundation. So let me tell you how I, I sorted all this out. During World War II, we know the Nazis, not good people, looted, stole, pillaged, hid, burned precious art and relics from people, uh, many of whom were Jews. Uh, they took things from churches, museums, galleries. And I had no idea how vast, how vast this was. We're talking millions of pieces of art that was taken. So I came to know about this. I was reading the obituary of a man named Harry Etlinger, the father of a high school friend of mine named Paul. And in the obituary, it mentioned that Harry had been one of the monuments men during World War II. So I'm like, who are these monuments men? So I do a little research and I find out that at the beginning, there was a small core group of American and I believe uh, maybe a British uh, man or two museum curators, art historians, librarians, architects, artists. So they were tasked with a really serious mission to go out and find find these the stolen art and relics, preserve the art if they can, all of this taken by the Nazis. But more so, their task was really preserving Western civilization from the destruction by the Nazis. Because if you erase art, you erase a heritage, you, you erase meanings, uh, what a history was about, what a people were about. And two American men, two monuments men were killed in this pursuit of justice. So I learned about this man named Robert Edsel, who is the founder and chairman of the Monuments Men Foundation. And the Monuments Men movie starring George Clooney and Matt Damon was based on his number one New York Times bestselling book by the title, The Monuments Men, Allied Heroes, Nazi Thieves, and the Greatest Treasure Hunt in History. He even executive produced and hosted the acclaimed television series, Hunting Nazi Treasures. So his Monuments Men Foundation honors these brave men and women uh, who did such incredible work. And he continues the mission to get this, find hundreds of thousands of still missing pieces, uh, many of it here in the United States, supposedly. I mean, hundreds of thousands is still missing. So he is, Mr. Robert Edsel is recognized today as one of the world's foremost advocates for art preservation, uh, President George Bush awarded the foundation the National Humanities Medal, the highest honor in the United States for work in the humanities. So that is quite, um, I think, a very lovely introduction. Let's welcome Robert Edsel. Thank you very much, Maureen. And it is a very lovely introduction, and I thank you. Well, you know, I did not know about this foundation, which is why I wanted to bring you on so others who may not have known about it now will. And what, what was interesting to me, Robert, was you were a business dude. You, you weren't, you're not a historian. You're not a military guy. How did this happen? Uh, a weird science experiment in a way. I had a very successful career in the oil exploration business, which I built from the ground up. I, my first ambition was to be a professional tennis player. And um, I, I had, after 15 years of dancing near the fire and a number of times I didn't think I was going to be, I was going to make it business wise with the fluctuation of oil and gas prices and just the, the challenges of running a business with such little capital. Um, we pioneered the use of horizontal drilling and that technology really took off. And I had an opportunity to sell the company when I was 39 and there were many other things I was interested in, but I never had time to pursue any of them. I mean, it was a 24 seven business. Mm -hmm. And um, my concern was making sure all the employees had jobs, which it took about a year for that to happen. The acquiring company didn't offer anybody positions, which was foolish. But uh, I made sure all the employees I had had jobs. And then I took off and started studying art and architecture in Florence, uh, something I was always interested in, but I never had time to do. And 
Um, in the course of doing that, I one day was walking across the Ponte Vecchio Bridge, which was the only bridge not blown up by the Nazis when they fled the city in August 1944. Wow. And I wondered how, in the face of the most destructive war in history that claimed 65 million lives, so many works of art and cultural monuments survived, and who were the people that saved them? And I didn't know the answer, and I wasn't embarrassed that I didn't know the answer, but I was hugely embarrassed it had never occurred to me to wonder. Oh. So I started asking people that I'd become friends with, Europeans, and they'd say, you know what, that's a great question. What's the answer? And I'd say, well, I don't know. You live here. And they said, I never thought about it. So it's this trick of the eye. We, 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 those of us that have been fortunate to be able to go to Europe, we visit the museums, we see these places, and they look like they always looked. But we know and from, from growing up and studying anything about World War II history, or just movies, that mm -hmm. this couldn't have been where they were during the war. They wouldn't exist today. And we're not talking about a few things, as you pointed out in your introduction. We're talking about millions of things that had to have been moved somewhere else during that time period or they would have been destroyed. Well, that's what blows my mind. And um, it, it's that millions. I, I, you know, you, you just you we study history. I have a brother who's a Marine who, you, you know, was a history teacher, uh, military history. And you're thinking I'm reading about the monuments, but I'm like millions and then to think about the Mona Lisa being carried from place to place so it isn't destroyed. And that's what I wanted to ask you. Uh, we'll get into some of the art that was found, some that was lost. And we're going to also get to Harry's son, Paul, in a bit. Uh, he's going to have a comment or two, I hope. But <laughs> who were these monuments men? Uh, the monuments men and women. Yay. You should mention them. Um, Please. And, and they're not overlooked by my work. It's just that I haven't really gotten to them yet. But these these were men and women, museum directors, curators, art historians, artists, professors, archivists, architects, and some were even artists themselves who volunteered for service during World War II, walking away from established careers. Their average <laughs> age was, was almost 40 when the average age of, of uh, soldiers was closer to 20. Wow. But they realized they had a contribution to make. You see this photo of, of Jim Rorimer standing on the steps of, a, of the what's the Disneyland castle, the castle of Nuschwanstein, um, with a little notepad in his hand. Rorimer would go on to become the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art after the war. But he's supervising soldiers that are removing three paintings out of the 22,000 works of art that they found in this castle that had been stolen from Jewish collectors in France. And this is how it went in the closing weeks of the war, uh, what, had what had been the greatest theft in history turned into the greatest treasure hunt in history, trying to locate these thousands of hidden locations where the Nazis placed works of art that had been looted so the, the monuments, men and women's initial task was to identify what cultural, what, what, what were the cultural um, targets that should be protected, that we should try and steer allied bombing away from to try and preserve. Mm -hmm. How could they work with battlefield commanders if there was a sniper in a church to avoid leveling the church uh, and if possible, not even destroy the bell tower? And they had this idea to do this. The, 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 the founder of the Monuments Men really was, a, was a, a, a man who was a pioneer in the preservation of cultural treasures, George Stout, who was old enough to have fought in World War I, and he had the vision to see, we're going to have to go to Europe and fight another war. He was convinced of that, even in the 1930s. And if we're not careful, we'll win the battle and lose the war. We'll destroy the Nazis but we'll destroy all of the cultural heritage that we're trying to preserve the signposts of civilization. That was, that's what's so, that is what's so powerful when you hear, you know, the, there's, it's civilization that's disappearing. It's civil, it's what, it's people's, they're not written words, but it's the scripts of the visual of what people, the sculpture, the art, right. the, the scrolls. Um, well, there were two things that really interested me about this story to the point of dedicating the last 20 years of my life to telling wow. it and continuing the work. One was there have always been bad guys in history. Hitler's worse, worse than most. Uh, we have to acknowledge Stalin probably killed as many of his own 
people, you know, 25 million people, something like that. Uh, but history's littered with bad guys. I wasn't interested in the bad guys. I was interested in the good guys. Why did these men and women do what they did? That was a noble undertaking, the likes of which we'd never seen before. And that was something that was meritorious to bring attention to. And so that was one of the the real key drivers to me wanting to make sure people knew about the story and, and finding a way to thank them. The other being imagine a world without these things. And we came perilously close. Um, and so that's, you know, that's something to be for all of us to be mindful of. I wanted to, uh, I, I want to go into more of the art that was um, lost and found, but I wanted to give a, um, a respectful shout out to one of the gentlemen. This is how I got connected to you. Uh, Harry, at linger, ETT, let's linger a little longer. That's how you yep. told me how you actually say it. Right in the middle there, in the center of that photo, I believe, next to you, who you have the look that you could have been a tennis player. I, I see that. I see that you came close. I, I get that. And you have him surrounded by the actors of the movie, The Monuments Men. It's very the, cool. When we were traveling, promoting the film in Europe, we had four different places we went to in a four day period. It was quite a whirlwind journey with the film premiere in Berlin, followed by a stop in Milan, a stop in London, and then we ended in Paris. And, uh, and when we were in Berlin, I said to George Clooney and a couple of people with the Fox movie studio that was in charge of the European distribution, you know, if we're gonna go to Milan, it's probably not going to be possible, but we would be remiss in not asking for permission to go into this refectory, this dining hall of Santa Maria della Grazia, where Leonardo painted The Last Supper and see if we couldn't do an interview in there. Oh and, my goodness. And the, and the clincher wasn't as much uh, fabulous, good looking and hardworking George Clooney and this amazing cast that he assembled. It was the fact that we had Harry Etlinger with us and they had such admiration for this uh, very old World War II veteran and we were granted permission to film inside the refectory. They closed it to the public, which oh is goodness. just unheard of. I mean, they're very stingy about even using flash photography. So we uh, had this, it, this uh, remarkable moment that there we all were gathered around one of the guys that was in these salt mines finding these stolen works of art. I would love to bring in his son. I think he's just on audio to uh, Paul to hear his, him tell us a little bit. Paul, are you there? I am there. Yes, I am here. Can oh, you I'm hear so me? Yes, we can. I'm so glad that you could weigh in. So we just showed a picture of your dad surrounded by the movie stars. But of course, he's front and center because he's the real star of the show. Tell us about your dad. Like, um, How did he get involved in becoming a Monuments Man? And a little bit about his experience in the salt mines where a lot of this art was hidden. Well, I'll say this, Maureen. So first of all, thank you again for this opportunity. And it's just great to see you connect with Robert. Um, I have tremendous respect for both of you. This is just a great story to tell. And um, you know, I, I think in the case of my dad, my dad was an immigrant, a Jew who escaped Nazi Germany as a 12-year-old, came to America. And eight years later, he's um, headed to Europe to fight against uh his former countrymen, which is a story in and of itself. And um, as Robert knows the story of my dad, he's uh, in the infantry, he's on his way to the Battle of the Bulge. He gets pulled off of a convoy because it turns out he spoke German. And at the time, uh, the American army needed German translators. In fact, ultimately he was a translator and interrogator at the Nuremberg trials. Unbelievable. Yeah. But anyway, he gets put into this group that's, uh, we now know as the Monuments Men and fast forward, um, lives a life, uh, raised myself and my two siblings and never mentions a word about what no. he did. Yeah. Which no. is so, which is so common of people from that generation to sort of be so humble and not mm. feel that they did anything really unique and uh, never said a word until this guy, Robert Edsel, wrote a book about it. <laughs> Wait a second, Paul. Yeah. I, I, first of all, we don't have the best audio with you, but I don't care because the story is so important. Um, so 
you knew nothing about your dad's history other than he, had, you didn't know he was a monuments man. You knew he served in World War II, but you didn't know what role he played until Robert started writing his book. That is the case. Could you hear me better, by the way? Much better. Thank you, darling. Okay, good. Um, yeah, that is exactly the case. It was, I, again, I don't think my father was unique for someone in that generation to really not mm -hmm. look back in their life retrospectively that they did anything special. They were, I think it was, you know, the greatest generation truly who um, just felt they were just doing their jobs as citizens. And my dad had this accomplishment, but he didn't really feel it was anything unique or special, never talked about it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the book came out that I, you know, I uncovered, I learned as the rest of America was learning about this, uh, this mm -hmm. group called the Monuments Men that Robert brought so much attention to. Uh, for those of you just uh, jumping in uh, on Hanging with Langan, this is really such an important show. We have Robert Etzel. He is the founder and chairman of the Monuments Men Foundation. And we're learning about what the monuments, well, he knows, but he's sharing with us what the men, Monuments Men did in World War II. There's a movie with George Clooney based on his number one best-selling book. And we have my friend from high school, Paul Etlinger, whose dad was one of the original Monuments Men. And if you see the movie, he's played by Epstein, the cute young guy who uh, can speak German and overhears what the German prisoners are saying. So I had to watch the movie again, Paul, before I had Robert on just to, to put everything in place again. But so, Paul, did your father then open up to you about his experiences once he started talking to Robert? Yeah, needed a little a little uh, coaxing there. And again, you know, I was sort of learning on the fly as I read Robert's book, um, uh, getting a little history lesson on my dad, right? So it was sort of an interesting aspect of all this. And then as my dad helped Robert in promoting the book and then subsequently the film, um, you know, so many more anecdotes and stories came out uh, that you know, I didn't learn until my dad was well into his 80s. Unbelievable. And um, you just think about that he was on his way to the Battle of the Bulge when he gets pulled because he can, he can speak German and that the whole trajectory of his life has changed yeah yeah and he, he Robert, that was not lost on him because he happened to have written a letter to his parents that day and he described it as the luckiest day of his life because it was his 19th birthday and there were eight buddies that he'd been through training with um who went on to the battle of the bulge that weren't pulled off the trucks and off the top of my head, as I recall, five of them were killed and uh, the others were injured. So it was pretty easy for him to see what he was pulled away from. And it haunted him for quite some time because the, he didn't know why they pulled him off. I mean, he had a month or two that he was just sitting idle, feeling guilty about not doing anything. But the war was at an inflection point and they recognized that there were so many Germans being captured and so many documents uh, that they were gaining access to that somebody had to go through and basically on the fly scan them and say, if it's not important, trash it. If it's important, just off the top of your head, tell us what it says. Then we can translate it in detail later. And they needed people like Harry that could do that. Absolutely amazing. So, Paul, what would you want people to know about your dad? Uh, he was the most patriotic, American-loving person I've ever encountered. Um, good, bad, you know, warts and all, America is still the greatest place in the world. Mm -hmm. And it gave his family uh, a second chance of life. And, um, you know, he lost a, a grandmother uh, uh, in the concentration camps. But America gave him a, you know, a second opportunity. And he was, um, you know, patriotic, honest, hardworking, truly a good dad, humble. Um, and I think Robert, by bringing attention to the, you know, previously unknown story about the Monuments Men and what America did, I shouldn't say America, it was really the Allies, um, was, you know, really brought the spotlight to a chapter in my father's life that I wasn't aware of. I will say this, my father, um, and, and Robert saw him in action. He, he loved a microphone, like he really enjoyed public speaking and his consistent message over and over again, 
uh, in virtually every speech he gave was the fact that uh, America and the Allies, for that matter, were really the first conquering army to not take away the spoils of war. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the decency of what the Allies did with the Marshall Plan to help rebuild Europe after the war and to essentially give back and not take, mm -hmm. that really hadn't ever happened in world history. And my father, again, being a proud American, would always point that out to the audience. Um, so it was really a great opportunity. And my, my dad passed away in uh, 2018, but he had a couple of years there um, where Robert's, um, you know, focus on this uh, unique chapter in World War II history was brought to the spotlight. He had a, a second chance and an opportunity to go around and tell the story of the monument spin. Well, here's the, the beautiful thing about his life. I, I never met your dad, but I read his obituary and then I it made me curious to know what monument, what the who the monuments men were. So I did research, and then you connected with me and told me about Robert. So that is that's the energy that keeps going, and I think that's a beautiful thing, Paul. Yep, keep telling the story. So I'll let the two of you go, but thank you again, Maureen, for inviting me on. And oh. I, I look forward to listening to Robert. Uh, hey, Robert, actually, one just little, uh, if you could share with the audience a little bit about what's going on with the. Um, the museum in Houston, because it's amazing how much art that was just absolutely pilfered and stolen by the Nazis is still in circulation. And there's an interesting controversy that I'll let Robert share with you. But uh, yeah. these issues still go on many decades later. I definitely want to. Paul, thank you and all the best to you and your family. And you're a gem for connecting me with Robert. Much appreciated. Yeah. Bye now. Maureen, may I add? Uh, Harry wasn't my dad. He was old enough to be my dad, uh, but I loved him. I loved him in so many different ways. Mm. And I was asked by Paul and the family to speak at his memorial service as I've done for more of the monuments, men and women that have passed than I like to remember in that respect. In answer to your question, uh, echoing what Paul said, humble to a fault, self-effacing. He understood as these other monuments officers did that the real heroes in their view were the men and women that didn't come home. Mm. And that's why they didn't talk about it because they felt it was disrespectful at a time when the, that word had impact. Yeah. When, and yeah. Harry was, um, Harry was all the good things about Americans that um, we're challenged with today. And it was easy to like Harry and he was a principled oriented person. And um, we all loved him. I mean, it was just uh, the, the, the best story I love telling about Harry, about the impact this one man had. When the film premiered in Berlin, there were, I believe, about 5,000 people at this movie theater. And when the film was over, the, the we took the stage, the actors, me, and, and we had Harry come up there. And when the audience there, for the first time, for many of the Germans, realized that the monuments, men and women, didn't just locate and return stolen works of art. They had a million works of art and cultural objects that belonged to German museums that the museums were either damaged or destroyed, but in any event, not able to have those things returned for years until they were rebuilt. And the monuments men and women were the guardians and custodians of those things until the museums could be rebuilt. And in the meantime, set up temporary exhibitions to reinforce among Germans that the allies weren't going to take these things. They're here, come see your things. And he received between a five to 10 minute standing ovation from his fellow Germans, thanking him and, and his colleagues for what they did. It was, it was one of the most emotional moments for all of the actors just to see this um, prodigal son come back to Germany who'd been given the boot by Hitler for being a Jewish boy. 
such an amazing story and it hasn't ended. The story continues on and that's what you're doing with the Monuments Men Foundation. What I wanted to ask you, let's talk, I wanna move on to current day, but first I, I need to ask you some questions about pieces of art that were taken and then retrieved. This was very emotional. The um, the Madonna, Michelangelo's uh, Madonna that was in Belgium, I believe, wasn't it? The Bruges? Correct. The yeah. Bruges Madonna. It's the only yeah. sculpture of Michelangelo's that left Italy during his lifetime, and it was in Bru in the town of Bruges, exactly. And it was taken by the Nazis from Bruges? Taken in the dead of night. They wrapped it in the burlap uh, mattress that you see it in right there. Underneath the, the uh, Christ child's head is the burlap mattress that they brought to wrap it up in like a ham and loaded it in on, onto a truck. The Germans were dressed in Red Cross uniforms and they put it on a ship and took it around the North Sea into Germany and then put it in one of the salt mines. And that is George Stout with the mustache who whose idea it was to create these cultural preservation officers. Today we know as monuments men and women who yeah. found this uh, deep in one of the salt mines in Altausay, Austria, along with almost 7,000 paintings, many of which were dedicated for uh, Hitler's Führer Museum, this museum he intended to build in his hometown of Linz, Austria. The Führer Museum, that's so, okay. Uh, for those of you who are uh, listening if this, on the podcast and you wanna see the visuals, you can go to patreon.com uh, forward slash Maureen Langan. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com Maureen Langan. So that if you wanna see the visuals, they're just absolutely um, incredible. And he wanted to make, and I'll show you another one, and then um, another photo I have here is uh, Leonardo da Vinci's. Uh, tell us what this one is. This is a painting. Leonardo's uh, credited with 16 fully autographed works of art, a lot of drawings, but as far as paintings, 16. Of course, The Last Supper in Milan couldn't be moved, but um, almost all of the paintings were on the road somewhere during World War II, either being hidden or were stolen. And this painting, Lady with an Ermine, uh, belongs to the Charter Rescue Museum in Krakow, Poland. It was stolen by the, the Nazis and moved, get this, on 12 separate occasions during the war because there were two senior Nazis, including Hermann Goering, who were bickering over it like two boys fighting over marbles. And they, one of them would get it and take it to Berlin, and the other one would send his henchmen to Berlin and get it and bring it back to Krakow. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So the Monuments Men find this painting in the possession of the Nazi uh, governor of Poland, Hans Frank, Hitler's attorney. And uh, they're there for this photo op that wasn't lost on them. They've taken it out of the crate. You can see the guy on the right, uh, Monuments Man Frank Albright, holding the paper that was protecting it when it was in the crate. And they've taken it out just to take a photograph. And it is on a train of which there were, uh, I believe, 19 train cars filled with works of art going back to Poland. And this was just one of the trains. And all told, how many pieces of art did the Monuments Men find and return? They located a total of about 5 million separate objects, uh, of which about 3 million were books, um, tens of thousands of paintings, drawings, tapestries, sculpture, butterfly collections. If it had value to it, it was important that they stole it. A million of the five million belonged to German museums and were returned to those museums as they were able to uh, to be to go back into operation. And about four million of the objects were stolen. The Monuments Men stayed in Europe until 1951 when the last one came home. Uh, they had not returned everything. Some things were turned over to the newly created German government to continue the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's an undercount, because as an example, if there was a jewelry chest that had 16 drawers and then separate trays within yeah. the drawers, that counted as one object. So, you know, the, the numbers are really you can just play games with them. But, you know, when it when we talk about millions, you think about that today all due respect to our friends in the legal profession, lawyers would be arguing over what to do with it. Uh, but the emergencies of war allowed them to follow a policy that said, we're going to take these things back to the countries they were stolen from and then work with committees 
of, of, of peer monuments officers from those countries to then determine, does it belong to an individual, a church, a museum, and get it back to them? And that's where some of the problems that we're living with today evolved from is some countries didn't do a good job. Some countries were opportunistic and kept some of these things. And uh, there's a deeply moving, moving photograph. Um, you have uh, an American rabbi chaplain, Sam Bender, standing on a pile of Torahs some 10 feet high uh, the, and, and touching these sacred parchments, which you're not supposed to do, because he's trying to identify what synagogue this thing came from. So it's part of the perversity. Um, I mean, I refer to it sometimes as gangster logic of the Nazis that you'd figure these, these sacred relics of the Jewish faith would be the very first things they would destroy. But there was a purpose. They wanted to keep these things and put them in racial museums they were going to create to demonstrate how Jews were subhuman. So because of that oddity and that, that as I say, perversity, they, these things actually survived. And, and a nice story. Many of the synagogues, of course, that were destroyed were never rebuilt. But with the immigration of Jews to Western Europe, to London, to the United States, uh, new synagogues were built. And uh, when, there, when it was clear that there was no place to return some of these things to, they were donated to the creation of these new synagogues so that the life could continue yeah, to be renewed. Right. And it's a really beautiful element. And you know what? So this it's not even a lunatic killer. It's just pure evil. He wanted to, to have his own. He wanted to steal everybody else's art and create his own museum. Everybody he else. Had, he was determined to. Hitler was an aspiring artist and he was. He was rejected at the art academy that he'd applied, and he was convinced that uh, a number of the people who rejected him were Jews. And he wags his finger at them and says, you know, my day will come, I'll get you, etc. And when he goes to Florence for the first state visit to Italy in 1938 and goes to the Uffizi and the Pitti Palace and spends two hours out of the 10 hours he's there on business, two hours in the museums, and he realizes what's possible. He sees these magnificent collections of the Medici's and thinks, you know, I mean, I'm the most powerful guy in the world in his mind. Um, it's all out there for the taking. And he has this idea to create this cultural complex in Linz anchored by this museum. Of course, there's a problem. Many of these things are already in other museums. They're in private collections. These are mere inconveniences for a man of such power. And as plans are created to invade, uh, to, to, um, merge Austria into the Reich and then to invade Poland, invade Czech, Czech Republic and Russia and other countries, these museum creators and uh, directors from Germany are in these countries years before the invasion, making lists of things that they intend to loot. So this is, some some have said, and this is going too far, that World War II is all about a looting operation. You know, that's not true. It's it, There's mm -hmm. ideological purposes to it as well. And Hitler's convinced the German people are are the only true, they're the true race. And, and to elevate people to believe that, he has to um, lower everyone's opinion about everyone else. I mean, Jews, gays, uh, Slavs, these are all humans, and he, has to, and he uses their works of art to denigrate them. So this was the other thing that drew me to this story. People, I think, too often think of the Holocaust as the murdering of, of Jews, the murdering of people, the murdering is the last thing. It's like the, the cat that brings in the snake and tosses it around in the air and bats it around and plays with it for hours. It's eventually going to kill it, but it doesn't do it right away. Hitler doesn't start off murdering people. He strips them of their rights. He makes sure they're, they're alive to, to experience this. He, he strips them of their right to own property. He starts confiscating their property. He confiscates their bank accounts. They create taxes for the fact that they're Jews. They rewrite the laws in these countries because they want it to look legal. Then they start incarcerating them. Then come the concentration camps. Then comes the murdering. But it's important to keep them alive. To, to dehumanize them until they're- Humiliate, humiliate. That's the thing that gets overlooked. 
But mm. when we talk about the works of art, they define who we are as a society. They, uh, these cultural treasures of the Jewish faith define who Jews are. If if they're if they just destroy them and then destroy the destroy the people where they can't see that he hasn't made them suffer to the degree that he wants to. Rather, keep them alive. Let them see by the time I'm done with you and murder you, that I want you to see there's going to be nothing left of what you believed in. It's going to be gone. And that's the pernicious element of what he did is the humiliation part. And too often wow. we, we focus on the dramatic elements, which are horrific. The the ovens, the uh, all the different ways people are tortured, murdered, and but we don't focus enough on the fact that this was seven years of this, longer than that, actually, in Nazi Germany, more than 10 years of the doing it to them and the humiliation part before the coup de grace of the murdering. Taking them piece by piece. Absolutely. Piece and, and, and this is the thing that it's an it's a this is the contemporary element of what we do. Every time we see ISIS, Al Qaeda. Uh, the Taliban, whoever it is, there's always people coming along, going in, saying in the name oftentimes of God or in our, our views, this is art, this isn't. This is blasphemous, this isn't. They don't go into Timbuktu or the Bamiyan Buddhas or other areas of the world, Syria, etc., and start murdering people. They start destroying the things that they venerate, the cultural treasures, the works of art, the documents. They always have the reasons. Because that's your soul. But that's the beginning. When that happens, it's a red flag murdering of people. It's right around the corner. And it happens that way every time. It's just like a fingerprint. Oh, I have so much more to talk. I'm going to reset the topic and just do a little commercial break here, Robert, and bring you back. We have so much more to talk about. Um, my guest is Robert Edsel. He is the founder and the chairman of the Monuments a men foundation here it is it's go to the website uh, monumentsmenfoundation.org follow him on facebook and instagram monuments men foundation and on facebook it's robert etzel author and on instagram it's robert etzel and you guys share this show this is how we grow the numbers uh you know i upload this on all the major podcast platforms apple spotify all of it review it on apple i, I would appreciate that and if you want to support the show it is supported by viewers just like yourselves at PayPal and Venmo at Molangan and Patreon is where you can do a monthly subscription. And that's really a great way to support the show. Patreon forward slash Maureen Langan. So you just go Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Maureen Langan. A monthly subscription. There's different tiers and you get different things. You get some backstage chats, extra. You'll go, go check it out and you'll see what you get. But the most important thing is, is you... Um, support the show. A few shout outs here. I want to say thank you, Johnny Aber, Jonathan Aber, good friend. Uh, he knew Harry. He's a good friend of Paul. Uh, thank you, Charlotte, David, Gilbert tuning in, Beth, they're loving this. Um, Jody Wasserman says Hitler couldn't write an interesting book. His book was horrible and boring. Um, his Anne Frank wrote a better book. She says, well, that is true. So let's come back. I want to talk about Jody. Um, and thank you folks for all watching and tuning in says, share it, please share it. David Gilbert. Nice to see you watching. Really appreciate it. Um, Hitler steals all this stuff. The Nazis steal all this stuff, Robert. Why did they burn so much of it as well? Well, of course, a lot was destroyed during the war. Uh, some of it were, some of it wasn't deliberate. Some of it was uh, incidental to war. There were 450 immensely valuable works of art in Berlin that were destroyed in one of their anti-aircraft towers. Probably works of art that were some, some that were stolen that were portable, and others uh, trying to cover up the theft. But there's no question there were ideological beliefs that works of art by painters like Kandinsky and Picasso uh, and the German expressionist who painted life not in a realistic basis, but a more interpretive basis. Mm -hmm. uh, Hitler had an easy time with them. He pointed to those things and say, everybody knows in the case of a Van Gogh that the sky isn't green and a meadow's not blue. Mm -hmm. It's the product of a defective mind. And we're not going to foul the minds of the German people. Those works have to be removed. People shouldn't be able to see those things. But of course, they were beloved artists then and they're beloved artists today. 
those some of those works were destroyed because they were considered created by defective people and therefore they can't be art. So there wasn't room in his view of of the superhuman race of Germans. And at the same point in time, he's promoting works by 19th century German artists that are not unimportant things, but in most museums in the United States, you will not find their works on display. But these were artists who were rejected in their own right. And Hitler felt a special communion with them because he was rejected. It's like, I know how great they were. I can see that because I was rejected too. So at the same time, he's building up what he wants the portrayal of this uber race to look like in the minds of Germans. He's also pointing to examples of what uh, the fouled mind looks like in destroying some of those works of art. Um, you know, what's interesting to say, if it isn't a, a mainstream uh, German artist, behind me is a, a painting by a... Um, young man with special needs. I, I host a uh, organization, Ability Paths uh, fundraiser every year, and it's people with special needs. And so I just want to show this for people watching. And this weekend when I hosted, I got this sculpture. So, you know, I always think people's art is a piece of their soul. And I feel honored when I'm able to have a piece of that shared with me at whatever level artist they are, because it comes from them. So anyway, that's just an aside. Ability Path is a great organization. Um, was there not a decree from Hitler that if he were to die during the war or Germany fall, that all the art should be burned? Or is that just like a, a folklore? I don't believe that's true. What happened at the very end of the war, um, the most rabid Nazis were, for the most part, the Austrians. And of course, it gets lost in the discussion. Hitler wasn't German. He was Austrian. Uh, he was surrounded by a lot of other Austrians, and some of them weren't the brightest bulbs in the room, but they know what to do with they, when they had power. And one of the Austrian gal lighters, kind of a, a, a mayor, if you will, um, was convinced that he knew what Hitler would have wanted and that he would have wanted these works of art in this mine where the Michelangelo Bruges Madonna was, where the Jan van Eyck Gen altarpiece was, where the 7,000 paintings were, including two Vermeers. Uh, and countless Rembrandts and Van Goghs and other things, the, that Hitler would never have wanted these works of art to fall into the hands of the enemy and that he would have preferred for these things to be destroyed. I don't believe that's the case, uh, but that that uh, Nazi made every effort to blow up that mine and planted bombs in the mine that the miners uh, helped defuse at the very last minute as the monuments officers were arising, were arriving. I think that was a little bit less altruistic than the fact that if the mine's blown up, they don't have a place to have a job. But I, what we do know that Hitler did is hours before he shoots himself, he dictates his last will and testament. And in his last will and testament, he doesn't care about the children of Germany and what they're going through or the German race. In fact, he says it's the Germans' fault. We proved the weaker race. The stronger race were the Soviets. But he does say, I want the works of art that I collected in my lifetime to go to this museum in Linz. So he's still in this um, delusional state that this, this fantasy museum, which there were drawings for, many of which by his own hand, but nothing was ever constructed, is still going to be constructed and that somehow in this Fourth Reich, there'll be these works of art that he curated in essence. So let me ask you this, Robert Etzel of the Monuments Men Foundation, founder and chairman. Uh, there are still current day, I wanna know how many pieces are still not accounted for, where you believe they are, and if founded, how, how is there a statute of limitations? I guess I'm being having humanity, there shouldn't be. Um, but you know, I mean, yeah, sure, be a decent person only until November 3rd, then it all bets are off. But what happened? Where are these pieces you believe now? Obviously, if they knew they'd be found, but where is it uh, surmised that they are? And how does one get them back to their rightful owners? If it's a Jewish family, uh, does it go to their um, offspring? Uh, this is what I want to know. Okay, go. Back to you, Robert. Uh, I'm so glad you saved the easy questions for last. <laughs> um, I had to set there it up. Are, there are hundreds of thousands of works of art 
worth billions of dollars that are still missing. In Poland alone, they have some 60,000 specific works of art on their database of things that they're missing just from Poland. Uh, and of course, we know porcelain was broken, gold and silver coins were melted down, jewels were removed from crowns and things and cut up. Mm -hmm. um, so not everything is fine to bowl, but these, the people during World War II were all depression babies and they, they lived, and my parents were depression babies. Anyone that's related, a grandparent or parents of, or, or kids of depression era people know that they saved everything. They preserved everything. Uh, and I think people so often underestimate how resourceful human beings are in desperate times. So if it existed, somebody picked it up somewhere and kept it because it might have been a way to bribe a customs official or put food on the table at a later date. Many of the things that are missing uh, in areas where the Soviet Red Army was are in former Soviet countries, um, whether that's Ukraine uh, or, uh, of course, Russia. And some, in some cases, they're acknowledged that they've got these things. They don't want to give them back. In cases where the American army was, uh, some of these things were brought home as souvenirs. We, The Monuments Men Foundation has found and returned some 30 objects over the last 10 years or so, all of which were in the possession of American soldiers or family members of American soldiers. And in all cases, except one brought home as souvenirs, having no idea what the importance was. Uh, it is true. It, uh, out of, out of the millions of American soldiers, sometimes things were deliberately stolen. Uh, that was against the rules. It was against the rules to bring things home as cultural treasures, but it happened. The Monuments Men Foundation exists to help families like that. We're not interested in getting people in trouble. We're interested in accepting what the left and shaking their hand and saying, thank you for preserving these things. And I'm glad you put up our tip line, one 866 W-W-I-I-A-R-T or 1-866-9944-9944. Uh, I believe. Uh, we have people call us all the time, send us emails, uh, photos, describe things that they've got. They're not sure what it is. We work with the families to identify it. We determine who the rightful owner is. We have ceremonies to return these things. We have an important ceremony coming up in early November here in two weeks to return some things uh, and they're joyous moments and really happy moments in the families to uh, be able to see these things go home. Well, how do people know if it is something from back in the day? How do they know if it's something that was taken during the war or should well, be I returned? Think if anyone's got something that's hanging in their house, whether it's a painting, a tapestry, an old musky book, and they know that they had a parent that was in World War II for fighting for any side, French, American, British, Russian, or they have an immigrant in the family like like uh, Harry was until he became a soldier uh, or a displaced person that came to the United States later on and they have some object, um, they should be concerned that it might belong to somebody else. And so the whole idea is if they send us an email, a photograph of it, we don't charge anybody for our services. We look, we do the best we can. We can't help everybody. We can't figure everything out, but we've figured out a lot of things. But there are also things hanging in American museums. And before we get to that, I want to say to people again, the toll-free tip line, it can be anonymous. You want to reach out or you want to see, hey, maybe um, Robert can help me uh, ascertain if this is something of value from that time. 1-800-WW-2R, uh, but two is done with the, you know, the capital I's. World War II, WW, capital I-I, art. one 866 W W capital I I R and go to Monuments Men uh, Foundation .org, and all the information is there too. Monuments Men Foundation .org. so it's all there for you. Okay, so you're saying some of it is in museums. Talk to me about that, Robert. The uh, you know after the war was over, the Jews who did survive, the last thing on their list to do was to be running around trying to figure out where their property was the degree of devastation was beyond our ability to co comprehend. It's, it's the two by two square block of, of uh, lower Manhattan on nine 11 on steroids. And mm -hmm. a lot of times the bar that was set 
for people to recover works of art or things that were stolen from their family was we'll provide some documentation. I'm sorry, everything I owned, including everybody in my family, was incinerated in a concentration camp or blown up in the town. I don't have any proof. So that created, I think, an unrealistic degree of expectation of people walking in. It was a normal request during an extraordinary time. But it's more the second generation kids and grandkids of those of the people that that uh, suffered through World War II that are using the tools of technology today to try photos from their family, um, documents that maybe their parents didn't know about to prove that they own certain things and try and track them down. And the, the in, in the late 1990s, there various countries, some 44 countries got together and created something called Washington Principles, which essentially said there's going to be a, a, a non-binding because they couldn't get anybody to agree to a binding deal, but a non-binding, I refer to it as an honor bar, a uh, non-binding agreement that everyone's going to pursue fair and just solutions. In other words, we're not going to run, circle the wagons, call the lawyers and run you through the financial ringer of right. trying to sue us. We're just going to look at it. And if, in fact, there's any kind of evidence that this was stolen or, or was sold under duress, we're going to return it. OK, well, those were wonderfully lofty words and it was a noble endeavor by the people trying to do it. But the, the linchpin of it, as far as I'm concerned, was to create a common portal that all museums if they, for all the works of art they had that had a missing ownership period, provenance is a fancy word for ownership. Who owned your house before you? That's yes. the provenance. Right. Who owned it? That's right. 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 So from 1932, when Hitler comes into power, to 1946, when he's toast, during that 14 year period, who, where was it? Was it in Europe? If it was the United States, it doesn't matter. But if it was likely that that object was in Europe, and you don't know where it was, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean it was stolen. It just means you're supposed to take a photograph of it and whatever information you've got and place it on this portal. And the concept was a great concept. If you're some poor person anywhere in the world and you can't afford to hire attorneys or you can't afford to go travel and look through museum collections or even buy museum catalogs to look for something that was stolen from you, you can through the power of the internet, go online to this common portal and see, is there anything there that was stolen from my family? What's a cool idea? Do we have a name? Is it still there? Well, I, I could give it to you, except it doesn't work. Oh, it doesn't work. Because nobody so, has integrity. Yeah, <laughs> so the problem was they had a really good idea, but the interest in complying with this waned very quickly. And mm. because there wasn't ever anybody to go out there and get the public stirred up about how wrong this was, and the fact that there's nobody guarding the hen house here, yeah. you, you have what you have now is an ad hoc uh, participation. You have some museums uh, that have done an outstanding job creating provenance research on the works of art in their museums. And they've done it not because of peer pressure. They've done it because it's the right thing to do. Oh, just right. like you said. It's the right thing to do. Right. Now, let me ask you this because Paul brought it up and I have read a bit about it. Um, do you want to touch on the museum? I believe it's in Houston. There's some controversy there. Would you share that with, with the people? With There's the a case in Houston involving a family known as the Emdens, uh, whose grandfather, Dr. Max Emden, was a very wealthy department store owner. He was a German Jew and he immigrated to uh, uh, Switzerland in the late 20s. I think believing he's got enough money, he can, he's a, he's up upwards of 50 or something. And he, he wanted to go just live a different life. And he felt like I've got plenty of money. I have income. I have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank in Germany. But when the Nazis took power, they passed all these laws and mm -hmm. he was restricted from getting his money. He couldn't Venmo it to himself. He couldn't wire transfer money. Oh. He couldn't get his money. So, He's in Switzerland and all he can do to pay the bills is sell the stuff he has in his house to meet bills. And he ultimately dies uh, largely insolvent because he, the Nazis squeezed him. He can't get his money. He can't get his income. It, it's, it's so beyond amazing. Well, anyway, he, there were three paintings that he sold by a Italian artist named Bernardo Bellotto. 
And the monuments men found all three of them at the end of the war. All three pictures were purchased by Hitler for his museum. They were given museum numbers, the Hitler Lens Museum number. Oh. And, and one of the paintings has been a much copied work of art and was erroneously by the monuments men sent to the Netherlands thinking it was a claim, somebody else's claim. The other two pictures were turned over to Germany at the end of the war because they weren't sure who they belonged to. In 2019, a commission in Germany comprised of, of scholars, including their equivalent of the Supreme Court justice, mm -hmm. the head of their Congress, et cetera, determined that the sale of Dr. Max Simden was because uh, loss of assets due to persecution. The Nazis ruined his life. They couldn't go into Switzerland and get him, but they shut off his cash flow. They disallowed him being able to access his assets, and he had no other choice than to do this. And they ordered that the two paintings that they had be returned to the family, and they were. The third picture is the same. It's the same fact set, and no one knew where it was. And the answer is it's hanging on the wall. In our view, it's hanging on the wall in the museum in Houston. They, for the longest while, didn't acknowledge that that was the same picture. They said it could be a copy of the Max Emden picture. We proved, I believe, conclusively, in our view, that it is the Max Emden picture through archival photographs that the Monuments Men Foundation unearthed here several months ago. And I would have hoped, as an outside party, that these this information and the fact that the matter has been adjudicated by this German advisory commission that the museum would have looked at this and said you know this is a third of those three paintings we received it as a gift from someone we haven't even paid anything for it this is the right thing to do but at least so far the museum has insisted that the sale in 1938 was a voluntary sale and that Dr. Max Emden chose to sell these three pictures, even though they're aware that the German Advisory Commission two years ago said that is not the case. Wow. He didn't do it voluntarily. So the Emdens, uh, as a consequence of being roadblocked, filed litigation against the Houston Museum of Fine Arts last week, uh, asking the courts to return this picture to their to the three brothers who are the surviving heirs of Dr. Max Emden and their grandfather. And uh, it's just, you know, we can end where we began. And Paul said it best. Harry Etlinger, at every single opportunity, he had a microphone in front of him, whether it was George Clooney or whether it was an audience of 5,000 people or the halls of Congress, said to the victors, do not belong the spoils of war. They should be returned to the families that they were taken from. And the fact that we're in 2021 debating in so many instances, cases like this, where because someone has possession of it and they certainly have a great deal of power and tremendous resources, uh, it's just a regrettable situation that is completely counter to the purpose of what the monuments men and women did and what they stood for and the sacrifices of men like Harry Etlinger and, as you mentioned earlier, Walter Hutchhausen, who was one of two monuments officers killed during combat trying to do his job. So handsome, handsome, handsome young man who, you know, you're, he fought for justice to, to save Western civilization, as you put it. And that is so, so powerful. I want to show another one more time, uh, Harry Etlinger, who um, is a father of my friend Paul. And Harry was one of the original Monuments Men. And there he is surrounded by the cast of oh, with Robert Etzel, of course, the founder of the Monuments Men Foundation, to honor these men and women and to keep the mission alive to get this art back in the rightful places. And Harry is surrounded, Robert wrote the book Monuments Men in the film that George Clooney and Matt Damon starred in, John Goodman. Uh, he's surrounded by all of them. And you're in Milan with the, the beautiful Last Supper, right? That's right. Ah. 
Could you not cry? And you know what? There's a slogan that I read that you have, Harry. It's what's in your attic to get people to come. Say what's in your attic. Let's leave it on that and, and the tip line. Yep. Well, look, we, we're we we're there to help people do the right thing. And we've had so many people come forward. And I can tell you, having worked with a number of veterans, they've walked over to me at the end of these ceremonies and said, next to having my family and having uh, served in the represented my country during World War II, this is one of the most proud moments of my life. Uh, and so it just goes to show the goodness of Americans in the twilight of their lives, still trying to be that greatest generation and, and, and in their own ways, trying to inspire us to be a great generation by doing the right thing. And if people see things in their attic, they can reach out or you know of art that you want checked out uh, or you have a tip anonymously, directly, whatever you want, 1-800-WW-I-Art at monumentsmenfoundation.org. How can people help the foundation, Robert? Well, we, of course, need supporters. We, we uh, welcome volunteers. Uh, but, you know, the, the work we do is costly. We don't charge people for the work we do because we believe people that have suffered during World War II have already paid. And so um, to be able to do that, you know, we depend on the support of the public. And, you know, if people don't mind uh, people in power or institutions or others getting away with things that are wrong, then don't contact us because we're not your organization. But if that kind of thing burns you up, mm -hmm. if that kind of injustice uh, upsets you and you want to cause during this period in time when a younger people in particular are looking for worthy causes, by all means, pick the phone up, call us, email us, uh, get contact us through social media because we need the help of the public to preserve these cultural treasures in the future. They're not going to survive by accident. And part of that begins with finishing the task that the Monuments Men and Women started and making sure we illuminate the path home for these remaining missing objects. Well, I'll tell you what I want to help with. When you want to start researching more of the monuments, I know you want to research the uh, Monuments Men and Women, um, I'm all bored researching some of these women. So you just call, I'm not kidding. I love research. I'm a lunatic. I love this stuff. Um, it would be like a thrill. So thank you for spending so much time with me today. Thank you, Maureen. That's a, I'm really uh, grateful to you. Thanks a million. All thank right. You. All the best to you and the monumentsmenfoundation.org. That's the incredible Robert Etzel doing such great work, you guys. Uh, support him at monumentsmenfoundation.org. And you know the deal. If you'd like to support me, you can do a one-time uh, donation at PayPal or Venmo at Molangen or become a monthly subscriber at patreon.com forward slash Maureen Langen. All of this gets uploaded to all the major podcast platforms. Share, review, let people know. Hang in with Langen. And you know the deal, you guys. Everybody loved this. I've got so, many, so much great feedback on Robert. And until we meet again. Bye, Wig.